Welcome to Dateline Health. Uh, this is Fred Lippman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. Uh, we uh, have a very special show. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, interest uh, about uh, some breakthroughs in cardiac care. <clears throat> and a, a number of people uh, who, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Osmond, which I'm going to introduce you in just a second, uh, this show really uh, comes from a lot of questions that come from our viewers. We're in our 20, almost 23rd year of doing this show. So we get questions from the viewers, and I try to get people like yourself to uh, give them answers. So let me introduce to you Dr. Ahmed F. Osman, and he's also the medical director of the electrophysiology lab at the Broward Health Medical Center. So welcome, doctor. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about, uh, we'll start w talking about the Watchmen. You know, uh, believe it or not, a lot of folks have been seeing advertisements on television about the Watchmen. And uh, they want to know what it's all about. It's a nice name. Uh, but uh, let's, let's talk about the, uh, the issues related to uh, your application of this, uh, of the, the watchman and any other breakthroughs in cardiac care. So it's all yours, doctor. Thank you very much. So um, uh, before I really tell you exactly what watchman is, I need to tell you a little bit about atrial fibrillation, which is the background disease that that basically involves watchman in its uh, in its management. Atrial fibrillation is the most common rhythm disorder that we manage and deal with clinically in cardiology. It is an abnormal, irregular, uh, we, 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 we colloquially call it a regularly irregular rhythm that affects um, up to 10% of the population above the age of 80. So at uh, 60, 65, uh, there's a good 5% of us that will have atrial fibrillation. And um, it uh, is a uh, rhythm uh, abnormality that is characterized by a uh, chaotic, irregular heartbeat that can cause a lot of different symptoms, uh, including shortness of breath, fatigue, palpitations, uh, it can lead to what we call heart failure, which is uh, basically, um, you know, inability of the heart to perform its functions to its uh, uh, best uh, design. And uh, but there are many patients that do not feel it and actually just get discovered with this disease by just doing an EKG on a routine visit. The, the problem with atrial fibrillation is, is, is twofold. I always tell my patients it's like a, a coin that has two sides. One side of the coin involves the symptoms that we just described and the potential for the heart function to deteriorate with atrial fibrillation if the heart rhythm is not controlled. And there's a lot of things that we do to control the rhythm specifically and bring the patient back to a normal sinus rhythm, which is the normal heartbeat. Uh, but the other side of the coin, which is really very, very crucial and of immediate uh, importance to the patient, is the fact that when we have the atrial fibrillation um, uh, process ongoing in the left and right atria, which are the upper chambers of the heart, we are promoting the formation of clots, of thrombus in the left upper chamber in particular, and that can lead to strokes. So, 20% of the strokes that are seen clinically by neurologists have to do with atrial fibrillation that causes clots and basically those clots can break off and travel to the brain and, and that can be devastating. These strokes are typically more severe, more recurrent, more fatal and lead to higher levels of disability in many, many of the patients. And it is a very preventable type of stroke. So it is important to detect atrial fibrillation uh, and diagnose it properly and assess our patients for uh, the measures that will prevent the stroke. So what are these measures? The most common traditional conventional way of doing things is by using anticoagulants. So these anticoagulants are medications that basically prevent formation of any clot anywhere in the body. And it's a systemic medication. So we have now luckily I'm sure you're familiar with warfarin, Coumadin, which we've had for uh, 50, 60, 70, 80, 80 years or so that um, had been, uh, you know, basically the, the standard of care in the last 20 years or so. We have access to newer agents, what we call direct oral anticoagulants that are much easier to take, that don't require monitoring, that are very effective at doing that. The problem 
with anticoagulation is that a lot of our patients uh, are at risk for bleeding. So uh, there are bleeding issues, whether it's in the gastrointestinal tract, whether it's just the bruising and, and uh, in the urinary tract, uh, in the eyes and the, the brain, you know, which is really the more severe type of bleeding problems that we can encounter. And that's what led to um, the search for alternatives. That's what the watchman, that's where the watchman comes into play. So we realized that the majority of clots, as a matter of fact, the series in the 90s showed that about 90% of clots that form in the heart form in a small pouch-like area in the left atrium, left upper chamber, that is called the left atrial appendage. And uh, the thought was, uh, perhaps we can either exclude or seal or occlude that little appendage and prevent clots from forming and therefore prevent stroke. And this was then tested in very large multiple studies uh, in the early 2000s uh, that showed that in fact, that when we do that and the initial version of the watchman was the, the initial kind of structure, you know, um, uh, iteration of the device itself uh, basically showed that in fact, you are just as protected as if you were taking your anticoagulant uh, continuously. So it did eliminate the risk of, uh, of strokes and a very dramatic reduction in the risk of bleeding, particularly hemorrhagic uh, strokes as well, because those are the really fatal ones, the hemorrhagic strokes. So we then um, tested this and, and confirmed these results. And that's what led to the approval of this watchman procedure or device uh, since 2015. Let me ask you this. Uh, a lot of the folks that uh, brought us questions about the Watchman, uh, they, they never, uh, at least in the questioning, really never concluded in their own minds, which is fine. I mean, they're not the, the uh, uh, educated healthcare professional. That's why they ask questions. Uh, but the, uh, the, in, the interest that you bring to this conversation relates a great deal to do with the, uh, the area of strokes uh, and uh, knowing that uh, actually one of the first certified stroke centers in the state of Florida was at uh, Broward Health North. My question really relates to a question that came from the folks out there and that is, with all the new technology you have, the, the, the watches, the, the bands, uh, the, the self, uh, shall we say, um, endeavored uh, cardiovascular monitors, uh, elements that are available to John Q. Citizen, uh, it would seem to me, according to what I'm hearing, is that a lot of what's going on can be envisioned and psychologically and electronically and through various venues uh, that have the ability to know what's going on to intervene almost immediately. Is that true? So, so the, the, the tricky part is just making the diagnosis. And you're absolutely correct. There is a plethora of uh, uh, consumer-based uh, products, watches, uh, phones, uh, sensors of many, many different kinds and types that can pick up abnormalities. And what I, I can tell you, if we look at the, the atrial fibrillation area, there's a lot of very good tools that are available to the consumer if they feel they are at risk for such, to detect it automatically. They're not perfect, but they are a very good uh, forward step in diagnose, early diagnosis of atrial fibrillation because you're absolutely correct. You don't want to wait for atrial fibrillation to be, to be established and uh, the patient presenting for the first time with a stroke, unknowing that, um, uh, that he has had atrial fibrillation for an unclear period of time. So there is a lot of uh, these devices, but you still unfortunately have to rely to uh, the community, the, uh, the, the, the patient, if you wish, to really notify or be uh, alerting his physician to any new development, any new symptom that you may be experiencing. Now, 
when you're having a stroke that there are neurological deficits that can become very obvious to either the patient himself or to his immediate family. And, and those need to be raising the, the alarm immediately to intervene and to be evaluated because time is, is, the, is of the essence. It's particularly when you're having an acute occlusion or an acute um, stroke uh, because you really want to save brain. And, and the faster you get to a certified uh, center that deals with strokes, such as Broward Health North and Broward Health Medical Center, which are really amazing places. I, I know all the neurologists in, in, in both institutions, and they provide a phenomenal service to the community in really uh, reversing uh, the, the potential devastating uh, debilitation that can come out of a stroke. So I've seen patients really go back to 100% normal if they get the immediate attention that they should they should receive. So time is of the essence. So we had this, and this is very important. We we had this came up. Believe it or not, I, we did a show all about a year and a half, two years ago, and we had uh, uh, EMT uh, folks here, the uh, EMT uh, people that are affiliated with the fire departments in various venues. And they were, they were really uh, very, very informative because they have the capability of communicating with colleagues of yours that are sitting there in the hospital. And uh, they, they can mitigate a great deal of the harm by, uh, I guess, being directed to use certain med medicaments and and IV products uh, before they get to the center. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that you, 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 you've seen this happen multiple times. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, it, it does highlight the importance of immediate intervention in those cases. But we want to step a step behind, back and prevent strokes completely in those patients who are predisposed to a stroke because of atrial fibrillation. And that's that's where this watchman. So. This is a Watchman device. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, I'm going to bring it to the pic, to the camera. It's a very small device that gets inserted through the femoral vein and the groin, all the uh, all the way up into the inside of the left atrial appendage. It does. Um, it's a one-time procedure. It takes about 30, 20, 20, 30 minutes to, to do. It involves a little bit of anesthesia and some imaging to allow us to access the left atrium and deploy this small device that is collapsed when it goes in, uh, in a sheath to seal off the left atrial appendage completely and once and for all. And um, we are now using the second generation Watchman, which has proven to be a phenomenal tool to uh, very much, uh, you know, uh, uh, make this procedure a very effective, very safe, and uh, very quick, honestly, a procedure uh, uh, in the right uh, uh, environment. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you got to that issue. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on your word. Uh, because, you know, uh, we sort of uh, have categorized uh, every year we try to see what area of, uh, of interest is most interesting to our viewers. And it's always, it's always cardiac issues, cancer, and surgical interventions. Now, when minimally invasive techniques come along, uh, of which you're talking about right now, uh, you're talking about a really, uh, you, you mentioned it, a very, uh, short, involved uh, surgical technique, which is done, and you can explain how they do it, uh, with with very little blood. I mean, this is just junk, you citizen saying, I don't want to be cut, I don't want to take all the blood, I don't want to take all the pain, and they are constantly asking. I mean, it all started out, oh, years ago, when we started to uh, do away, I shouldn't say totally do away, with what uh, open heart surgery, and we started to use stents, and uh, it, it 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 evolved over the last 23 years. And people, but still, even the top three issues is still the issue of cardiology and 
uh, minimally invasive techniques. So go, go, go. Let's touch on that one more time. Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> there's been a lot of uh, evolution in how we treat our patients with uh, for very, very uh, uh, critical disease processes. And you're absolutely correct. We have basically gone from the very large, for instance, in coronary artery disease, sort of having to go through all the very large open heart type of procedures, which carry, you know, some risk, some morbidity, and some mortality as well, to some uh, endovascular intervention. So a lot of the procedures that we had to do open surgery for are now done endovascularly. And we're talking about not just the coronary disease and the stents, as you mentioned, but also valve replacement. So in the area of valve disease, there's been a tremendous revolution in how much we can tackle without open incisions, without open heart. So endovascular, we can treat a large, large portion of patients who have severe aortic stenosis, for instance. A lot of the transcutaneous aortic valve uh, replacement procedures, or what we call TAVR, are done very successfully by, by using what, again, through the artery in the, in the groin. So no scar, it's just an entry point in the groin to allow us to basically replace the valve and insert a new a uh, large stent-like valve within that very stenotic valve. And, and pa- the patients are saved from so much more hospital hospitalization days and, and morbidity and, and potential for infection and so on and so forth. Likewise, for the mitral valve, we are doing a lot of what we call uh, transcutaneous edge-to-edge repair, tier uh, procedures, which involve also access through the groin and to treat the mitral regurgitation that way. And that's kind of reserved to the higher risk patients for open heart, but things are moving in that direction so that I foresee that eventually a lot of the valve diseases would be treated endovascularly without any open surgery. I keep on telling our viewers, you, you've, you've got to talk to your doctors. You, you've got to, if something is bothering you, you can't just go into a supermarket or a pharmacy, pick something up off the shelf and say, oh, um, you know, I had this little uh, pain, I had this little thing, I had uh, whatever. I, and you, you got to see your primary care physicians. Does that come into your, your general, I mean, you have a, a very sophisticated electrophysiologic lab and a, a program, but people have to get to you. Yes, absolutely. So you're raising the, the issue of... Uh, our, basically awareness of what's available to to your patients. And that involves a process of, uh, just like we educate ourselves with the latest and the greatest technologies and interventions, we actually have a responsibility as subspecialists to go out to the community and to our colleagues uh, in the primary care uh, area and even in the general cardiology area to educate them and, and share with them the exciting things that we can do for their patients. It's an ongoing process um, that um, I can tell you for a fact that Broward Health has been very, very active with. We really have a series of uh, um, not just patient or, and community talks and, and presentations, but we have some uh, uh, physician uh, uh, meetings and uh, symposia. As a matter of fact, we have a cardiovascular symposium that we're very proud of that we conduct every year in February. And I'll, I'll definitely uh, extend an invitation to you to join us, which has really been very well received by uh, the medical community, where we try to highlight the the newer advances and newer approaches to a lot of different cardiovascular problems. So it is our responsibility to do so. Um, It is uh, part of uh, kind of education, uh, uh, ongoing education, uh, both within our network of physicians, as well as in all to all the, ne- the physicians in the community. So um, we are very active in doing that. We've given several talks about how to, you know, use Watchmen for those patients. And, um, and Broward has been very successful at that program. We've had the largest program in Broward County now. We've just celebrated our 400th implant over the last several years, and uh, we're very proud of, uh, of of that achievement, that milestone. Well, the, you know the uh, the wonderment, and that's and I I congr- I've congratulated your uh, your 
you know, CEO on uh, investing monies in, in the new technology. And I thank uh, Broward Health for providing it for the community because really uh, we have to get back to going to community centers. We have to get back to going to where people are, whether it be, uh, count, whether it be city commission chambers or county commission chambers and get away from the hospital structure and tell them what's going on. Why should they have to watch television to find out about the watchman? When you have the, the mind, the brilliance, and the education of someone like yourself and your colleagues. So uh, that's why I, I really wanted to have you as our guest today because I really think the people who watch us really need to know that there are people out there that not only have saved lives through this insidious pandemic, but are looking to save your lives well beyond that. I mean, if you came through it and you were okay, why not continue taking care of yourself? That's an oversimplistic statement, but I'm sure that you agree. I 100% agree. Yes, absolutely. And uh, uh, again, it's, um, I, I think it's, it's a responsibility, uh, but it's also a pleasure and an honor to be involved with Broward Health because I think they reach out to the community in very many different ways. And we also, what I didn't mention to you yet, is that we have a lot of research that's clinical, relevant, very important, that's ongoing at Broward Health. Um, so, for instance, in the area of, of Watchmen, we are looking uh, as part of a international multi-center study at whether Watchmen should be an alternative to anticoagulation period for anybody who should be anticoagulated because of atrial fibrillation. And uh, this very large champ, it's called the champion study, will basically randomize patients to Watchmen versus staying on their anticoagulant. And uh, I feel that it may well become a, a first-line alternative, uh, which really is a, a revolutionary kind of idea if you think about the burden of having to be on a blood thinner for the rest of your life and the potential for bleeds, for injury, for uh, you know, bleeding does catch up with patients, unfortunately, versus having this one-time 20 to 30 minute procedure that will protect you just as well. So that really is very exciting in my opinion. And um, I would uh, certainly uh, uh, invite uh, your audience, if anybody's interested uh, in, in having a chance of getting uh, the watchman just as a first line to try to reach out to us uh, and see if that's an option for them. I, I've had the privilege of uh, being cared for by a cardiologist co colleague of yours, Dr. Chisler for years, yeah. for years, and uh, I could tell you that uh, he always used to say to me, it's this oversimplistic things. You gotta watch your nourishment, you gotta watch your, your, your intake of fluids. You can't, you can't get up in the middle of the night and expect uh, just to walk around. You gotta take a sip of this and that and everything. You know, and really oversimplistic things that would help the viewers. So uh, I, I, I mean, we could spend another hour doing this, but we're down to the last two minutes of the show. So uh, I want to thank you, uh, not only as a cardiologist and an endocrinologist, as a medical director of the electrophysiology lab, but I want to thank you as a human being. Uh, I want to thank you for your willingness, uh, your compassion, and your uh, understanding that there are people out there that have, don't have the knowledge and you've got to reach out to them. You've got to give them some semblance of reason as to why they need to take care of themselves. So as I always say, and I've said it before, I always say to our folks out there, please take care of yourself. You got a little pain, you got a little this, you get a little dizzy, you stand up, whatever. Don't just let it go by. You've got to talk to your physician, whoever it might be, whether it's the internal medicine physician, the general physician, the cardiologist or whatever, you have to do it. You can't let things go by. So thank you again. Uh, as the medical director, as I said, as the electrophysiology lab, 
You're a, a blessing to our community. Uh, we thank you. We certainly, we discussed before the show your, your multiplicity of, of travels around the country, getting your knowledge. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, do well for the people of South Florida. And uh, I want to thank you and the center for investing in the equipment and the knowledge which comes with you. So thank you very, very much. More than welcome. Folks, uh, I hope that, uh, I don't know how many more times I can say it, but I just want you to take good care of yourself. So if you please, uh, don't let things go by. Uh, make people aware of what's going on. And uh, remember, that's what this show is all about. We try to give you answers. And sometimes we give you questions. And the question is, when's the last time you saw your doctor? My name is Fred Lippman. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. This show is called Dateline Health. And until next time, see you.